Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining me again for another LVS film reading session. For those of you who are new to these sessions, my name is Ian Jones, and uh, I'm a radiologist. I graduated from the RBC way back in 2003. Um, I got my RCVS imaging certificate in 2009, and I went back to the RBC to uh, complete my residency in diagnostic imaging between 2013 and 2016, and I got my European diploma in imaging in 2018. And uh, these days you can find me at London Veterinary Specialists, which is a multidisciplinary referral hospital in North London. And if you have any questions at all about anything imaging related, if you'd like to have a chat about uh, what imaging modality to use to best work up a case, or if you have some radiographs that you're struggling with, um, then don't hesitate to uh, drop me a line, um, either by giving me a call on this number um, or dropping me an email at this email address. So this evening we're going to have a look at some cases um, which uh, hopefully uh, you've had a chance to review. And the idea is that while reviewing the cases, um, you produce a radiology report. Now, uh, you shouldn't spend too much time on each case, um, so roughly 15 minutes. But in those 15 minutes, um, it's uh, ideal to produce uh, a report that consists of a complete radiographic description. I'm using as many uh, radiographic buzzwords as you can possibly think of, and then to conclude uh, on your comprehensive description of all of the most pertinent radiographic findings for each of those cases, and then to conclude on all of those findings. And in your conclusion, um, it's ideal if you have a ranked list of differentials uh, ranging from those causes that are most likely um, to those differentials that are least likely. And then finally, um, if you have any recommendations that you think might help get to the bottom of why the patient um, has presented, um, be it an abdominal ultrasound um, or a thoracic CT, um, then you should state that because there may be some additional images to look at for each of those cases. So before we begin, uh, we'll just take a look at an example from uh, last month's film reading. Um, so this is a 10-year-old female neutered lurcher that presented as dyspneic. Um, for this case, um, there are two images. There's a right lateral thorax and there's a DV thorax. So if we start with the right lateral thorax, um, there is some effacement um, of the cardiac silhouette. Um, there's maybe um, very subtle retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma from the thoracic wall. Um, there's uh, a couple of uh, fissure lines here as well, which we can see here and here. Um, there's also some flattening of the diaphragm. Um, and if you look very closely in this view, um, you can see that there's a very curious raised periosteal reaction associated with multiple ribs. If we look at the DV view, a lot of those findings um, are repeated. So again, it's really tricky for us to see the cardiac silhouette here. So there's a face of the cardiac silhouette, um, there's some retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma from the thoracic wall, and there's a couple of little pleural fissure lines. There's a little pleural fissure here, probably between the left cranial lung lobe and the left caudal lung lobe, and some associated retraction of that parenchyma from the thoracic wall. Um, and most importantly, that raised periosteal reaction that we could see in that right lateral view affecting a few of the ribs we can see uh, affecting most of the ribs in this view. So we've got a raised periosteal reaction here, affecting some of the caudal ribs, um, and also affecting some of the cranial ribs as well. Um, so our conclusion for this case would be that there's a non-specific pleural effusion, um, and uh, that really could be anything. It could be um, a transudate, a modified transudate, an exudate, it could be a callus effusion, or it could even be hemorrhage. But we need to try and link that non-specific pleural effusion in with the changes that we're seeing in um, all of these ribs. Um, so could it possibly be a chronic pyothorax? And um, the uh, smooth raised periosteal reaction we're seeing on the ribs um, related to an underlying chronic infection, um, or could it be something neoplastic? So if there was um, a primary neoplasia, say, affecting the pleura, then that might potentially result in some changes 
uh, to the adjacent ribs. So uh, a recommendation here uh, would be to CT the thorax. And for those of you who were here last week, um, you will have seen the CT. Um, you will know um, that as well as the non-specific pleural effusion and the raised periosteal reaction affecting multiple ribs, there were multiple pleural masses in this patient. And the diagnosis um, was a mesothelioma. So that's uh, an example um, of what I'd like from you guys this evening. Um, so at this point, uh, we are going to open up the floor um, to uh, the group and uh, we can have a discussion about uh, case number one, which is a five month old female entire French bulldog uh, that's presented to you with an acute left hind lameness. Um, so we've got a few radiographs to evaluate here. So. Um, we have um, cortical cranial radiographs of both the left and the right stifle, and mediolateral radiographs of both the left and the right stifle. Um, so, is there anyone who fancies case number one? Uh, I don't mind getting started, Ian. Yeah, sounds great. Go for it. Um, so, I'll probably start with the uh, mediolateral. I think that's probably the most useful one on the left hind limb. Um, so, it's a skeletally immature dog, and the physes are open. Um, the tibial tuberosity, I think, is the normal physis kind of looking at the contralateral limb um, rather than an avulsion fracture or anything. Um, I think the most significant finding is that there's um, a proximal tibial kind of metaphyseal diaphyseal fracture. Um, I'd describe it as complete um, and the fracture line is curved um, with the kind of proximal um, fragment being concave and the distal fragment being convex. Okay. Um, I'd say it's kind of moderately displaced with that distal fragment uh, pivoting around that curved fracture site, um, kind of displacing it moderately cordially. Um, there's no subcar emphysema that would suggest it's open. Yep. Um, and there's also, I think, what I'd describe as complete segmental fracture of the fibula. Um, it, it seems thicker and slightly abnormal, but I'm not entirely sure why when you compare it to the right limb. Um, now, I, I know these kind of fractures are quite unusual because I think mechanically they usually affect the physes or kind of the middle of the diaphysis. Um, but I did find this kind of described in the vet record um, that they are finding these fractures in immature dogs um, with that kind of same curved um, fracture at the distal aspect. Um, and it's usually from a fall and usually terriers that are overrepresented. Um, okay. But it's been kind of successfully managed with kind of open reduction and internal fixation. Okay. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. So um, there are lots of fractures here. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, describing this fracture, um, you've described it as uh, closed um, because there's no evidence of any subcutaneous emphysema, and I absolutely agree. Um, I think we can be confident this is a closed fracture. Um, it's it's not articular. Um, so you know, you've described this fracture as being uh, metaphyseal, and I think that's reasonable. Um, you also mentioned that some of the diaphysis could be involved. And again, I, I agree. Um, I think this is uh, predominantly metaphyseal, but some of the proximal diaphysis might be involved. But as you pointed out significantly, it doesn't seem to be affecting um, the proximal physis of this left tibia, which is unusual. So normally uh, with these skeletally immature patients that have open physis, it's the physis that is the point of weakness. And when these limbs fracture, um, the, the fracture tends to happen in and around the physis and involving the physis. And in that instance, we, we can describe them as Salter Harris fractures. Here, it, it, it isn't, this fracture doesn't appear to be in, involving the physis. So it, it wouldn't, wouldn't be reasonable to describe it as a Salter Harris fracture. Um, so we've got these, these two principal fracture fragments, and we've got a proximal fragment and a distal fragment. And, um, we should be describing the position of the distal fragment relative to the proximal fragment. And this distal fragment is displaced um, cordially relative to this proximal fragment. Now, there are a couple of features of this uh, tibial fracture, and also the fractures that you described affecting the fibula that I'd like you guys to um, maybe expand upon. Um, so this uh, skeletally immature French bulldog was described as... Um, becoming acutely lame. Um, so how likely do you think it is that this is an acute fracture versus, um, an, 
and a different sort of direction. Um, what are the radiographic features that might allow us to answer that question? Um, so I guess you're looking at kind of smoothness um, and regularity. Those things I think would suggest chronicity. Yeah. Um, so th would you say the fibula does seem to be smoother than you'd expect? Um, so in terms of the, the fibula, I, I agree that this this left fibula relative to the right fibula, um, it's it's certainly thickened. Um, now I, I could believe that this this radiolucency at the level of the proximal left fibula represents a normal physis, but it, it's it's difficult to explain the two transverse fissures that are bisecting that left proximal fibula um, at, at the level of the proximal diaphysis. So these these most likely represent fractures. And there, there are some features associated with the transverse fractures of this proximal fibula and also this left proximal tibia that, that might suggest a degree of chronicity to this fracture. And you've already mentioned one. So in very acute fractures, the um, fracture, the edges of the fragments are, are very sharp and very clear. Um, and, and here they're a little bit rounded um, and not quite as clearly modulated as we might expect if this was a key, if this was an acute fracture. Um, anything else about this fracture that might suggest a degree of chronicity rather than it being an acute fracture? Um, I, I think sclerosis, but I can't see any here that was, I can't see that anywhere here. Yeah, so uh, sclerosis, absolutely right. And to be, I, I, I probably would say that there's, there's, a, there's an increased opacity of the proximal aspect of this distal fracture fragment, and that could potentially represent a degree of sclerosis. So yeah, maybe a little bit of sclerosis right. of that medullary cavity. Anything else? So if we just look at the, the fibula for a moment, what, what, what do you think this area here represents? And, and to a lesser extent, this area here. Uh, I mean, based on what you've said, I'm assuming that's that's a callus. Yeah, so I mean, that, that, that could absolutely represent a bit of periosteal bridging there. Um, uh, so on the cranial aspect and also um, on the caudal aspect as well. So if, if we're seeing rounded fracture fragments, if we're seeing uh, some sclerosis of the adjacent medullary cavity, and if we're seeing some evidence of, of periosteal bridging, and we've already mentioned the fact that we think that this left fibula is a little bit thickened relative to the right, that could potentially represent some remodeling of this bone, then that, that suggests that this fracture is maybe not quite as acute as we would uh, otherwise be led to believe. So um, the reason why this case has been included is it's a good practice to uh, describe um, these sorts of fractures uh, comprehensively. Um, and we focused on the mediolateral views initially. And I absolutely agree with your description. So um, there's a uh, closed, uh, non-articular, uh, complete transverse fracture of the proximal uh, left tibial metaphysis um, with uh, caudal displacement of the distal fragment relative to the proximal fragment. And there are at least two uh, complete transverse closed non-articular fra fractures of the proximal left fibula. Now, there's also uh, rounding of the composite fracture fragments, uh, some sclerosis of the edges of the composite fragments and uh, some periosteal bridging and remodeling of the left proximal fibula. Um, so that all suggests that this fracture is maybe a little bit more chronic than um, we first thought. Uh, the only other thing that I um, would maybe describe here is, is, is this structure. So um, in the uh, quadricranial view of the left stifle, we can see that there's a uh, clearly marginated, uh, small mineralized uh, structure just at the level of the medial aspect of the left proximal tibia. Um, and that might represent um, a small um, bone fragment um, that's just rotated um, proximal medially. But the main thing I wanted you guys to get out of this and, and the features that I wanted you to describe were um, not only the fracture, um, but also the fact that this seems like a, a chronic fracture rather than an acute fracture. And that gives us an opportunity um, to potentially revise what we'd expect to see uh, in terms of bone healing 
um, when re-evaluating fractures. Um, so uh, in the first 10 days uh, following a fracture, um, the fractures, uh, the fracture fragments are going to start to lose the sharp margins. So uh, initially, um, if the fracture is very acute, um, the fracture fragments are going to be really clearly marginated um, and the margins are going to be really sharp. Um, and then over the next five to 10 days, um, those fragments are going to lose their sharp margins and um, demineralize um, to a certain extent. And because of that demineralization, we're going to see slight widening um, of the fracture gap. Um, in the next couple of weeks, um, we're going to start to see um, some evidence of um, callus formation and periosteal bridging. So we might see some endosteal and periosteal callus. And um, that uh, fracture gap um, that widened during the first two weeks um, is going to start to reduce in size. Um, if there are any free fracture fragments um, that are um, a little bit ischemic, uh, we might start to see some loss of opacity of those fracture fragments as well. And then over the next four weeks, um, hopefully, if the fracture is healing normally, um, we're going to start to see those fracture lines gradually disappear. We're going to start to see more evidence of external callus formation and an increase in opacity um, of the bone as it starts to remodel. Um, and then in the months that follow, um, we're going to see continuous remodeling. Um, eventually, we hope to start to see um, that that fracture completely disappear and start to see a normal trabecular pattern develop within the callus um, and complete cortical remodeling, so um, contiguous um, cortices where uh, that fracture once was. So um, th this, this is an interesting case because it presented as an acute lameness, um, but in fact um, it's a chronic fracture and um, that gives us an opportunity to uh, just revise all of the radiographic features associated with fracture chronicity, um, which we've just discussed. So yeah, nice job. Um, any of you guys have any questions at all about uh, case number one? So nice orthopedic case to get us started off. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, in, in, the, in the medial lateral, the, the fibula looks really swollen, like yeah. thick end. Yeah. Do, do you think it's more related with the remodeling because it's chronic or would you put in differential some sort of uh, me metabolic um, disease like chondral uh, dysplasia or like yeah. so, some osteodysplasia or met metabolic disease of, you know, growing or... Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I suppose if, if if there was some sort of metabolic disease here, I'd, I'd maybe expect the changes to be bilateral rather than unilateral. Um, interestingly, when when I saw this this fibula, um, it 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 sparked the memory of uh, segmentation of the fibula, and uh, that memory was related to uh, a section of of Thrall that talks about segmentalization of the fibula in in horses. Um, so. Um, in equine patients, um, you can have uh, segmentalization of the fibula, and um, it's, it's an incidental finding, and it's just related to separate centers of ossification. Um, I don't think you can get that in, in dogs. I think it's, it's just an equine thing, um, but I could be wrong about that. Um, in, in terms of it being sort of a, a more systemic problem and a metabolic problem, um, I wouldn't necessarily uh, be able to give you any clear differentials for what might make the fibula look like that. Um, and if it was a systemic problem, a metabolic problem, I, I might expect the changes to be bilateral rather than just affect this left hind limb. And also we, we know that, that this dog has had some trauma to its left hind limb because we can be pretty confident about the fact that this left proximal tibial metaphysis is fractured. So it's, it's maybe not unreasonable to assume that these fissure lines here are also fractures and the changes to the fibula um, are related to trauma that occurred at the same time as this uh, tibial fracture and then the um, unusual shape and opacity of this fibula um, is, is related to these fractures. That, that, that was where I got to it. But I, I absolutely take your point. There are potentially other reasons why this fibula might look like this. Thanks. No worries. Everybody happy with case number one? Okay. That means we move on to case number two. Uh, which uh, is another French Bulldog, um, this time a little bit older. So this is a six-year-old male neutered French Bulldog. It's presented to you with abdominal pain. Um, so 
there are two radiographs um, for us to evaluate. And we've got a right lateral, which is kind of a right lateral dogogram, really. So we've got the thorax and most of the abdomen in. Um, and then we've got a DVV as well, which again is, um, is a bit of a dogogram. We've got the thorax and, and most of the cranial abdomen as well. So anybody fancy case number two? I can have a go. Yeah, go for it. Okay, we have two radiographic projection of a skeletally mature dog. Um, the thorax is included in the projection. Uh, there are multiple um, misshaped hemivertebra at the level of the um, thoracic column. And um, like there is an increase of soft tissue opacity um, within the ventral and caudal aspect of the of the lung uh, of the lung lobes which is likely related to the fact that they are respiratory and plus is a french bulldog so usually the mm, the shape of the thorax is a bit is a bit misshaped um, Moving to the abdomen, there is a generalized reduced serosa details, so we cannot really uh, distinguish the organ inside. Um, there is a sort of tongue shaped um, structure within the ventral abdomen, which uh, is likely to be the spleen in the right, uh, because we are on the right, on the right lateral. And I cannot really see any um, liver, liver silhouette um, possible because the border are within the gastric axis and there are some gas field possible small intestinal loops, which they are um, probably partially dorsally displaced um, and really, cannot really see the bladder as well due to this loss of details. Um, in the DV projection, there is um, mineralized, is a really focal, really small mineralized um, structure is in the lateral, right lateral, no, sorry, left lateral. Yeah, it's at the level of the mid abdomen, which I'm not sure if it's a sort of following of the costochondral um, cartilage, but um, I'm not sure if it's within one of the intestinal loops or, um, um, I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, I think the DV, it, it, it doesn't help me a lot because I can just see these you know, reduced details. I can really, I can <clears throat> just see some gas filled intestinal loop and um, stomach. Yep. So I, I, I would probably put in differential diagnosis um, a generalized possible um, peritonitis, like inflammation of the mesentery, I am small uh, amount of free fluid in the abdomen, and um, I, I cannot rule out any foreign body and um, secondary perforation of the gut. Yep. So uh, I, I, I would probably advise an abdominal ultrasound in this case. Yeah, absolutely. No, um, I completely agree. Nice job. Um, so now these are not the, the best radiographs, um, but um, they do contain some very useful information in terms of trying to decide why exactly this uh, six-year-old French bulldog has presented to us with abdominal pain. So um, I thought the description was um, excellent and comprehensive. So we've got a whole bunch of um, ab abnormal thoracic vertebra. Um, pretty standard um, for a French bulldog, so we're not going to get too distracted by that. Um, the thorax, um, because this is a French bulldog and this is an expiratory view, uh, it does look very uh, abnormal, so uh, we do have an interstitial pattern in the dorsocaudal thorax, so there's a little bit of an increase in interstitial opacity here. It's quite hard to see the cardiac silhouette, um, and also the sternum are abnormal, so they all look fused. But we can pretty much write a lot of that off to this being a French bulldog and this being an expiratory radiograph. Um, the abdomen is really the main event here, and um, that's the reason why this doc is presented. So it's presented with abdominal pain. And I absolutely agree that there is uh, reduced serosal detail here. So 
uh, we can see the borders of some of the abdominal organs, um, but certainly not all of them. So it's really tricky to make out the liver. I mean, we can presume that it's going to be in the cranioventral abdomen just here, but it's really difficult to know where the margins of the liver actually are. Um, it's difficult to see the urinary bladder. Uh, we can't really see the kidneys either, um, only um, some gas within the small bowel. And then we've got uh, this uh, poorly marginated, and we described it as, as tongue shape, which I think is reasonable, um, soft tissue opaque structure within the uh, mid ventral abdomen. And uh, this structure um, is responsible for displacing all of those gas filled small intestines dorsally. And uh, you suggested that this could be the spleen, um, and I agree, it's, it's, it's in a, the right location for the spleen, um, but it is pretty chunky. Um, so um, that is uh, quite a, a chunky spleen, if, if that is indeed what we're looking at here. Um, other than the associated displacement of those gas filled small intestines, um, there isn't really much else to say about this right lateral view. There's a little bit of gas down here, which is probably um, gas that's within a little loop of small bowel that we can't quite see. In the DV view, um, it's not ideal, so the really VD views would be uh, best for assessing the abdomen. Um, we're not going to concentrate at all really on the thorax. We've got this abnormal thoracic vertebra, and we can see the cardiac silhouette reasonably well here, um, and the pulmonary parenchyma um, looks fine. So uh, let's continue to concentrate on the abdomen. And again, um, we've got this reduced cerebral detail, um, difficult to really see the liver, can't really see the kidneys, um, can't really see any of the other abdominal organs. And we've got um, some gas within the gastric fundus here, which, which looks pretty normal. And as you pointed out, there is um, this little mineralized focus in the left cranial abdomen. Um, difficult to know how significant that is. Could just be a little bit of mineralized cartilage associated with this last group. Could be something else. Um, in terms of uh, whether this, whether or not this dog is obstructed, I mean, we've got, from what I can see, just a single population of small bowel that contains a small amount of gas. Um, so. Um, there aren't really the features that we'd expect if uh, this patient does have a mechanical illness. So we're, we're not seeing two distinct populations of small bowel. Um, we're not seeing um, any stacking of the small bowel. We can't see a front body. Um, however, there is loss of peritoneal cirrhosis in detail. Um, so um, maybe you can't take it off the table completely, but it, it's maybe further down. Um, and in terms of uh, the other pertinent radiographic features, I mean, other than the loss of peritoneal cirrhosis detail, and I absolutely agree that the top differential for this would be a non-specific small volume peritoneal effusion, uh, what we're left with is, is, is this structure here. So we've got this um, poorly marginated, um, sort of tongue-shaped ovoid soft tissue opacity within the um, mid-ventral abdomen. Um, and you suggested it could be the spleen, and, and I agree. So we probably need to think of some differentials for um, uh, a non-specific soft tissue mass within the mid-ventral abdomen that, that's likely to be the spleen. So lots of differentials that we can come up with, combined with the fact that we've we've got loss of peritoneal cirrhosis of detail here. What, what could this be? And how can we relate it to the fact that we've got loss of peritoneal cirrhosis of detail? And that's that's for anybody, I suppose, not uh, not just for Nick and I. I think it it could possibly be a hematoma, hematosarcoma. Um, that if it's bleeding, I guess could explain yeah. the loss of detail. Yeah, absolutely. So it could could potentially be a splenic mass. And um, if this was a splenic mass like a hemangiosarc um, that is bleeding, um, then this patient could have a hemoabdomen, and that would absolutely explain the loss of peritoneal cirrhosis detail. Uh, so yeah, that fits. That checks out. It could also be a benign thing, like a, a bleeding hematoma. Yeah, absolutely. So just because you can see a splenic mass doesn't necessarily mean it's malignant. Um, so you, you can get really big splenic hematomas that can pop, um, and uh, those patients are going to have um, big abnormal spleens and are going to have peritoneal effusion. Um, so yeah, that's on that's on the table as well. Anything else? I mean, I think those differentials are reasonable. Um, and certainly looking at these radiographs, um, I couldn't think of many other things that, that this could be um, when I evaluated um, this set of films. Um, so uh, you recommended an abdominal ultrasound, and I think that is absolutely reasonable. Um, so uh, we have some ultrasound images 
to look at. Um, so I can I can walk you through these these ultrasound images because I think it's really challenging to interpret ultrasound images that uh, somebody else has acquired. Um, always best to uh, try and interpret ultrasound in real time rather than looking at stills. So uh, we've got uh, our first image here, um, which uh, shows the spleen. Um, so we can see the spleen here, and the spleen is looking pretty chunky. Um, so we've got um, some rounded margins of the spleen, um, and also uh, we can see the splenic vein here, and we can see some hyperechoic fat that's just adjacent to the spleen, um, and also a small volume peritoneal effusion. So just here, um, we've got um, some anechoic fluid um, that's just adjacent to the spleen. Um, so that confirms our suspicions. Um, the fact that we've got a small volume peritoneal effusion here explains why there was such poor peritoneal cirrhosal detail in those radiographs. Uh, in the next image, um, we are just uh, fanning around the spleen and then looking at the body of the spleen. Um, so here we've got um, more of the spleen. Uh, this is the spleen. Um, it's looking pretty chunky um, and it's pretty rounded. Um, so we've got smooth, rounded margins of the spleen. Um, and the exogenicity of the spleen also looks abnormal. So the exogenicity is very uh, heterogeneous. Um, so uh, normally, um, I'd expect the spleen um, to have a more uniformly um, hyperechoic exogenicity than this. Um, so this spleen is is pretty abnormal. Um, it's big, it's rounded, it has a heterogeneous exogenicity. Um, so uh, that structure that we can see in the mid-ventral abdomen on the radiographs um, is uh, almost certainly the spleen, based on our initial sonographic findings. And not only that, but the spleen is pretty abnormal. This is another uh, image of the spleen, um, and uh, what we can see uh, is, uh, again, rounded margins of the spleen. Um, we've also got uh, the splenic vein um, just here, um, and we've got hyperechoic fat um, just adjacent to the spleen. Um, so, having looked at the ultrasound images, um, does anybody have any more of an idea what might be going on here in I mean, the splenic vein at the beginning wasn't complete. Uh, it's not completely epicoic, uh, the the, cent the center of the of the vein. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I can tell you. Uh, so, I, I, I mean, I, we don't have any Doppler, but I, I probably I would check for any sort of thrombus or. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Um, so what I can say is if, if you were to put uh, a um, color Doppler on this image, then there wouldn't be any flow in this black there. And there would be reduced flow in this black frame. Could it be splenic torsion? Splenic torsion is a decent shout. Um, so uh, in patients with splenic torsion, um, what we typically expect to see would be a, uh, it's usually described as a starry sky pattern um, for the splenic parenchyma. So typically, um, in all of the splenic torsions that I've seen previously, um, the splenic parenchyma um, is a high poechoic diffusely, um, and it's permeated by really high poechoic foci, which is why it's called um, a starry sky pattern. Now, that isn't what we're seeing here. Um, so this spleen um, is diffusely enlarged um, with smooth rounded margins and has a heterogeneous echogenicity. Um, however, there are some other features here that are, might fit with splenic torsion. So um, splenic torsion, um, you can see um, thick hyperechoic perisplenic fat, and that is what we're seeing here. And if this spleen was torsed, then we would expect to see uh, reduced flow uh, within the splenic vasculature. And even though I didn't have a Doppler image to show you, um, trust me, there was no flow in this splenic vein and reduced flow in the splenic parenchyma. So there are some features here that, that fit the splenic torsion. We've got a big, rounded, heterogeneous spleen. Um, we've got hyperechoic, thick, perisplenic fat. We've also got a, peri I've also got a peritoneal effusion. So, um, a peritoneal effusion is a feature of splenic torsion, and um, it can appear hemorrhagic. Um, and what I can tell you is if you guys were to have tapped this peritoneal effusion, then it was a hemorrhagic effusion. So 
um, this patient effectively has um, a hemoemptin. Um, if we go back to the radiographs, um, it's it's pretty tricky to be confident about this change, um, but, but normally we'd expect the head of the spleen to be here. Now, we can't see it in this radiograph, and uh, that could be because there's lots of peritoneal cerebral detail. But the fact that we can't see the head of the spleen where it should be, which is in the um, left dorsocranial abdomen, and the fact that we've got a giant spleen in the midventral abdomen means that spike torsion is a possibility here. It's unlikely, uh, given the breed um, and potentially the way that this patient's presented, um, but it's certainly something that we should consider, and particularly given that I, I really can't see any, any sign of, of the head of the spleen here. And an ultrasound, we've got peritoneal effusion, it's hemorrhagic, that fits with spike torsion. We've got a giant spleen, so it's, it's diffusely enlarged with rounded margins and with a heterogeneous sexionicity with reduced flow in the splenic veins and the splenic parenchyma and also a very thick hypoechoic splenic fat. That all fits with splenic torsion. It doesn't have a starry sky appearance, which doesn't fit with splenic torsion. And, and certainly um, all of the previous cases of splenic torsion that I've seen have had this starry sky pattern affecting the spleen, but it, it certainly should still be um, on the differential list. So uh, my question to you guys now before we move on um, is, what do we think? What do we think, what, what are we gonna do next with this guy? And I can tell you that um, because of the hemoabdomen, this patient had uh, a blood transfusion, and was quite profoundly anemic as a result of the hemoabdomen. Um, clinically, the blood transfusion didn't really improve things. Um, so still have abdominal pain, still lethargic, still inappetent, um, still a very ill patient. What do we think we should do? And if anyone is uh, shy uh, and they don't want to speak up, then uh, they can communicate via the chat. Um, so, so we've got one one vote for XLAP. Anybody else think we should XLAP this dog? Yeah. <laughs> so, so a few votes for XLAP. Um, yeah, and, and I agree. Uh, I think uh, there's we've got we've got enough information to sufficiently justify an X-lap here. So uh, we've got a hemoabdomen um, on the radiographs. Um, we've got uh, a big spleen that is abnormally positioned. And on the abdominal ultrasound, um, we've got uh, some sonographic changes that are compatible with um, splenic torsion. Um, so that's what we did. So this patient went for our X-lap, and, and this is what we found. Um, so this is uh, a picture taken interoperatively of uh, the spleen in this patient. So spleen is huge, um, as we might expect. Um, and we've got this, this hemorrhagic uh, peritoneal effusion, um, and we've got this really thick um, splenic, perisplenic fat, which we could see on the ultrasound. Um, so um, that really confirms all of the sonographic changes that we picked up when we were scanning this patient. Now, um, the question is, does this dog have a splenic torsion? And the answer is it absolutely has a splenic torsion. Um, so uh, this is, again, a picture taken interoperatively. Um, and if any of you guys have wondered what a splenic torsion looks like interoperatively, um, it looks like this. Um, and and you, you can see that all of these splenic vessels are all twisted round and round and round and round um, as this spleen has tools. Um, so uh, this uh, is an example of a splenic torsion in a French bulldog, um, which is really unusual. Um, so that isn't typical at all um, of splenic torsion. Um, and the sonographic changes in this case um, are not typical either, um, which is why I'm sharing it with you, because um, this is not how I've seen splenic torsion present previously, um, and not how I've seen it uh, appear on ultrasound. Which made me do a little bit of reading uh, in terms of, well, um, if splenic torsions don't usually appear on ultrasound as having a starry sky, then how do they usually appear? Um, and the answer is uh, the signal month for this case is, is unusual. So uh, it's usually big dogs. Um, so, you know, it's usually um, German shepherds um, and, and, you know, big dogs um, with big abdomens where there's lots of room for the spleen to move around. Um, it isn't unheard of that splenic torsion uh, 
happens in a, in a smaller dog, and it has been reported um, in dogs like English Bulldogs, and it's also been reported in a Boston Terrier. But it is unusual um, to see a splenic torsion in a French Bulldog. But that is exactly what this dog has. Um, they can present as hemoabdomens. Um, so um, it's, it's absolutely documented that um, patients with splenic torsion present with non-specific clinical signs like abdominal pain or lethargy or GI signs. And, and you pop the probe on their abdomen and you can see some peritoneal effusion and you tap it and it's blood. Um, the fact that it's a hemoabdomen, um, splenic torsion is on the list. Nine times out of 10, maybe 99 times out of 100, it's, it's gonna be some other sort of splenic problem. It's gonna be a ruptured tumor, it's gonna be um, a liver tumor that's ruptured, but splenic torsions have a hemoabdomen um, and that's not uncommon. Um, they sometimes present with a palpable abdominal mass. Um, so the vet that does the initial physical examination, um, they'll, they'll feel the abdomen, they think there's, there's a mass here. And that, that's the giant spleen um, that's become engorged with blood um, because all of those vessels are all twisted up. Um, the starry sky appearance is, is typical and I'm pretty pathognomonic. However, um, you don't have to see a starry sky spleen in order for it to be torsed. And that's, that's what this case taught me. So all of the other splenic torsions I've ever seen had always had this starry sky appearance not the case in this patient. Um, so even though it is typical, um, it, if you don't see a starry sky appearance in the spleen, that doesn't mean you can completely rule it out. Um, the other changes that you'd expect to see um, on ultrasound um, would be a big spleen, um, an abnormal splenic parenchyma, an abnormal splenic position. Um, so something that I didn't tell you guys when we were looking at the ultrasound images is that I couldn't really find the head of the spleen in this dog on ultrasound. Um, so that, that fits with the radiographic findings. So the fact that we couldn't see the head of the spleen on the radiographs, couldn't find the head of the spleen on ultrasound, meant that this, this spleen was likely in an abnormal position. Um, absolutely, you mentioned thrombosis. You can see thrombosis of the splenic vessels, um, also reduced blood flow in the splenic vessels and within the spleen. Um, and um, there's, there's been this hyperechoic perivenous triangle that's been described. Um, so that really thick hyperechoic um, perisplenic fat, um, that's, that's a typical feature um, of splenic torsion. Um, so there we go. That's an example of a splenic torsion in a French bulldog. Um, I've never seen one before. Um, now you guys have, and hopefully um, you guys will be able to uh, recognize a splenic torsion if one comes along. Probably not in a French bulldog, probably in a dog that's much bigger, um, but really useful case um, to allow us to review um, all of the typical features of the splenic torsion. So yeah, nice job. So I promise none of the other cases are quite as unusual as that one. <laughs> so, so case number three, which is a little bit more typical, um, is, is an eight-year-old female neutered domestic short head cat. It's presented as dysneic. Um, anybody fancy case number three? And there aren't really any surprises with this one, I promise. It's, uh, it's, it's much more typical. I'm happy to give it a go. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so um, we have three views of uh, skeletally mature cats. Um, I think the quality of the x-rays is acceptable. However, there's probably a blurry element because the animal is rapid breathing. Um, on the right lateral chest view, I can't see any obvious skeletal problems. And the abdominal cavity appears within normal limits. Yeah. Um, the cardiac silhouette appears enlarged, and I believe yep. there is cardiomegaly. Yep. Um, so in the vertebral head score, if I'm not mistaken, is around nine in this case. And there's an abnormally enlarged left atrium as See. well. Um, I think there's lung lobe retraction, especially on the cordodosa and the craniventral lung lobe. And I think there's increased lung opacity on the cordial and the mid lung lobes on both right and, and left sides, more visible on the, um, I think, dorsal ventral view. And I think I can even see two bronchograms. Um, so with respect to the pulmonary vessels, I've got my suspicion that they can be enlarged, but I cannot confirm 100% on these radiographs because yep. of the microchip location and also because it's quite blurry. Um, yep. But I'm not sure if the, um, uh, the artery might be a little bit more enlarged, but I, I don't know. So I guess 
with cocardiomegaly, with enlarged left atrium, pulmonary edema, and possible pleural effusion as well. So cardiac yep. disease is quite high on, on my list, but I would like to proceed with a TFAS to confirm my diagnosis. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I completely agree with all of those findings um, and also uh, the conclusion. Um, so, uh, as you've described so beautifully, um, we've got cardiomegaly here. So, this, this heart is too big um, for a cat. Um, so, we've got increased sternal contact and we've got slight elevation of the cardiac apex from the sternum um, in this right lateral view, um, which is abnormal. Um, you mentioned the visual heart score. Um, and I think that's a reasonable way of assessing cardiac size, but just, just eyeballing this heart, um, it, it takes up almost three intercostal spaces, so that's too big for a cat. Um, we've also got this bulging of the caudal border of the cardiac silhouette, and um, in a cat, um, that is compatible with left atrial enlargement. So left atrial enlargement in a cat, um, usually way more subtle um, than in a dog. So a cat with a big left atrium secondary to HCM um, is going to have a, a subtle bulging of the caudal border of the cardiac silhouette compared to, say, a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel that has a big left atrium um, secondary to uh, mitral valve disease. It's going to have a huge left atrium that is going to take up a lot of the hyaline region and more often than not is going to displace that trachea dorsally. So this little bulge here um, is absolutely typical of a big left atrium in a cat. Um, I completely agree that we, we can't really comment on the pulmonary vasculature. They, 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 it's pretty tricky to see the cranial lumbar vessels <coughs> in this right lateral view. Um, and in the DV view as well, um, it's really hard to see them um, because of this patchy interstitial pattern. Um, in the right lateral view, um, we have got this, this patchy increase in interstitial opacity, predominantly um, dorsally and caudally, um, and that could absolutely represent pulmonary edema. And we've got potentially a very slight retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma from the thoracic wall, although it is, it is pretty subtle. Um, it could be a tiny little fissure line um, just here, although um, if there is a fissure line um, and these lobes are retracted, um, then the pleural effusion is going to be a really small volume. Um, and certainly that, that, isn't the more, that isn't the most significant radiographic change here, the most significant feature. In the DV view, um, as you pointed out, we've got again these, these patchy increases in interstitial opacity, um, both in the right caudal um, and in the left uh, caudal lung lobes. Um, and uh, on top of that, we've got associated effacement of the margins of the diaphragm as well. And we see similar changes in this left lateral view. So uh, again, the heart kind of looks chunky, we've got this slightly bulgy caudal border of the cardiac silhouette, and then this patchy increase in interstitial opacity. Um, so yeah, I completely agree. Um, we've got cardiomegaly, we've got left atrial enlargement, we've got a patchy increase in distitial opacity uh, bilaterally, and that fits best with underlying cardiac problem, most likely uh, HCM because of the left atrial enlargement and an associated left-sided heart failure and pulmonary edema with maybe a small volume pleural effusion. Um, so the reason why this case um, is in um, is just to demonstrate what <coughs> a big left atrium looks like um, in the lateral views in a cat, as we've already mentioned, usually much more subtle in a cat than in a dog with say mitral valve disease. So you're just going to see kind of a big heart and then just bulging of the caudal border of the cardiac silhouette. Um, also to demonstrate that the distribution of pulmonary edema in a cat that is in left-sided failure um, is um, not as predictable as in a dog. So in a dog with mitral valve disease, that has left-sided failure, you typically expect the pulmonary edema to form in the hyalur region and dorsally and caudally. Um, in a cat, um, it's, it's much more random. Um, so uh, having uh, patchy areas of uh, either heavy interstitial or alveolar change throughout the lung um, would be typical for a cat in heart failure. Um, the edema doesn't follow the rules, the same rules as dogs, so it isn't the hyalur and dorsal and caudal, it could be anywhere. Um, so the fact that in this DV view, we've got these sort of patchy areas of increased capacity um, bilaterally and, and uh, throughout the lung, particularly caudally and a little bit more cranially on the left, again, fits with pulmonary edema um, in a cat. Um, in cats with HCM, uh, in, in a DV view, uh, what, what's most typical is this valentine-shaped heart. Um, so in the DV view, you see um, a big left atrium, and it's often described as 
bilaterally enlarged atria, um, but the heart looks like a Valentine heart. We can't really see that here uh, because the margins of the cardiac cilia are being effaced by um, what we think is this edema that's in the left um, caudal and the right caudal lobes. Um, so yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, any Anything else about these radiographs that you guys might want to comment on? And uh, more about radiographic technique rather than uh, actual pathology, because I think you pretty much nailed that. Um, we can be pretty confident about uh, why this cat is dyspneic. So we're pretty confident this is a cat that has underlying cardiac disease. Um, it's got a big left atrium. It's most likely got HCM and uh, left-sided heart failure with pulmonary edema. That's pretty good. Uh, yeah, what else, what else is going on here that, um, that we might want to comment on? and potentially be horrified by if we see it. And uh, yeah, Rosa is, uh, has nailed it. Anybody else see anything that you guys might want to comment on? The hand of the radiographer. Yeah, so this, this view's fine. So that's all cat. But then we've got this. And then in this view, we've got this. So these are hands in the primary beam which we should never, never, never do. Um, so uh, this is just to, um, to emphasize to you guys the importance of good radiographic technique. It is never okay to have your hand in the primary beam. Never, never get your fingers in the primary beam. Never, never get your hand in the primary beam. Um, if you do, then that's what it looks like. Um, but you shouldn't ever be looking at radiographs that have fingers um, in the primary beam. All right. Okay, good job. So that was case number three. So that just leaves us. Oh, anybody have any questions about case number three before we move on? Um, I just wanted to quickly ask about, um, you know, the one or two air bronchograms. Is that not is that not enough to call it alveolar rather than interstitial, or is that not? Yeah, correct? no, 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 absolutely. If you if you think you can see air bronchograms, and, and I don't disagree, there could be some little air bronchograms here, then you can call it alveolar. Um, if if you see air bronchograms, then it's an alveolar pattern. So in order for there to be a bronchograms, there, there, have, there has to be infiltrate not only within the alveoli, but also within the interstition that's separating the alveoli and the bronchi. Um, so if you see a bronchograms, um, means you can't see any, any other pulmonary architecture adjacent to it. So you can't see any of the vessels that are adjacent to it. Has to be alveolar. A bronchograms equal alveolar. So and I, I don't disagree. There could be a few little bronchograms here. If you see a bronchograms, it's alveolar. Thanks. Okay, everybody happy? That just leaves number four, which uh, is, is another orthopedic case. And this time it's a one-year-old male entire Labrador uh, that's presented uh, with um, a fall in length. Um, so this dog has um, a mild intermittent shifting fall in limbs, which is not unusual for a one-year-old Labrador to present with. Um, so uh, who fancies case number four? And these are absolutely the sort of radiographs that you guys are going to be evaluating in first opinion practice. This is absolutely the type of case that is going to present to you. And I promise it's not a splenic torsion. <laughs> Anybody fancy number four? It's a nice one, my friends. No, nobody fancies number four. I can do it. This is definitely not the hardest case of the bunch. You want I can do it? Yeah, any any takers. Any takers. Okay. So we have a cranial caudal and a mediolateral view of the distal humerus, elbow joint, proximal radius, and ulna of both four limbs yep. of a completely mature dog. So in the left uh, four limb, we can see bone deposition, cranial to the radial head for osteophytes. Uh, yeah. And we can see them also on the right. Sorry, I'm jumping from one. Yeah. Um, in the right forelimb, 
So here we can see osteophytes, also medial to the edge, to the medial edge of the coronoid process of the ulna. There. And uh, again, on the cranial radial head and also the humerocondyle cranially. And then antesiophytes on the anconeal process of the ulna. There. Yeah. And in the right, the joint, it looks a bit fuzzy. It's not as clearly defined as in the left. And uh, the humeral condyle, it seems to me a bit less rounded. So, and possibly there is some bone sclerosis adjacent, adjacent to the ulna notch. Yep. And yeah, that's it basically. And um, the, the left is definitely better yep. than the right. So the changes are a lot less severe. Here, the cranial edge of the coronoid process is probably still quite distinct, whereas in the right is more um, is more fuzzy, more indistinct, everything. So yep. it's definitely worse. So okay. my uh, main differentials is uh, I have a suspicion of fragmented coronoid yep. process, so elbow dysplasia, basically. Um, definitely worse on the right. And yep. I would recommend a CT scan yep. because of the bones over, over in position in the elbow, you can't really see uh, clearly. And then possibly an arthroscopy yep. if necessary. Yeah, absolutely. OK. Um... Everybody happy with all of those changes? Um, so I, I absolutely agree. I have pretty much nothing to add. Um, so uh, we have similar changes um, in the left and the right elbow. Um, the changes are certainly more severe on the right. Um, so um, if we just uh, take another quick look at the right, um, as you've described, uh, we've got osteophytes um, on the cranial surface of the uh, proximal radius here, uh, potentially. Um, on the cranial aspect of this uncanine process. Um, we've got uh, what looks to be a small, clearly marginated mineralized structure just adjacent to the medial coronoid. Now, that, that could potentially be an osteophyte, um, or it could be a, a little fragment. Um, it, it's, it's difficult to say um, just by looking at these radiographs. So osteophyte and fragment should absolutely be on the differential list here. Um, I, I agree that um, this trochlear notch looks a little bit more sclerotic um, than it should, and um, all of that uh, is going to tie together nicely um, for us to give this dog um, potentially medial coronoid disease. Uh, so on the left, uh, we've got smaller osteophytes um, just on the cranial surface of the proximal radius. Um, again, maybe some more subtle sclerosis of this trochlear notch. Um, the medial coronoid here uh, looks okay, so the margins look reasonably crisp and clean. Um, so uh, we are still suspicious that there's bilateral disease here um, because we do have some changes on the left. We've got um, this subtle sclerosis and also uh, these osteophytes. Um, but certainly we have um, changes on the right um, that would lead us to believe that there's bilateral medial coronary disease, maybe even some fragmentation of this right medial coronary process. Um, so yeah, good job, um, absolutely. Uh, anybody else have anything to add to that description, which I think was excellent, um, before we take a look at CT? Because that's what's coming. Okay, everybody happy? Okay, <clears throat> so recommended a CT. I think that's absolutely uh, the right thing to do here. Um, so we'll just play the CT through. So this is a 1.25 millimeter bone reconstruction of both the left and the right elbows. It's running through reasonably quickly, um, but we're going to come back and take a look at um, the more pertinent features. Let's run that through and let's stop it. Uh, let's just scroll it. So we've got uh, this is this is left, this is right. So let's take a look at the right one first. So we're just coming to the level of the medial coronoid just now. So already uh, we're starting to see some uh, osteophytes. Um, so we've got some osteophytes here. So those osteophytes that we could see on the cranial surface of the proximal radius, that's what these are. And we're starting to see some osteophytes on the medial coronoid as well. 
Let's go run that on slightly. Again, this is our medial colonoid, and there is our fragment. So that little mineralized structure we can see uh, on the radiographs is this little structure here. Um, so that is a huge fragment that's originated from this right medial colonoid. Um, so uh, our suspicions of this patient having a fragmented right medial colonoid were absolutely on the money. Um, there's a big fragment associated with this colonoid. Um, this medial colonoid is also um, abnormal, so um, it, it's quite sclerotic. Um, so the attenuation of this medial colonoid is uh, increased relative to what we might expect. And we're seeing all of those osteophytes on this CT scan that we saw on the radiograph. I'm just going to run that on slightly. So this is now our humeral condyle, and there's some osteophytes there as well. So a few little osteophytes um, on the medial surface of that humeral condyle. And then a few little osteophytes potentially on that canal process that we, we, we could also see on the radiograph maybe around here. So let's take a look at the left. So we're going to pull this back and take a look at the left. So the left, the changes were much more subtle. Um, so on the left, we really only could see <coughs> some osteophytes on the cranial surface of that proximal radius, maybe some sclerosis of the uh, trochlear notch. Uh, we couldn't really see uh, any evidence of any fragmentation on the left, but let's, let's take a, a closer look. So we're just coming to the level of the medial coronoid now on the left. That's our medial coronoid. Actually, there is a tiny wee little fragment um, on that left medial coronoid that we couldn't really see on the radiograph. So just here, there's, there's a very subtle little fissure line that's just bisecting that medial coronoid. We've got a little fragment that's just adjacent to it, just there. as well as uh, those changes um, that we picked up on the radiograph. Uh, we've, we've also got some sclerosis of that medial coronoid, so very similar to what we're seeing on the right. Um, and as we said before, we've got these osteophytes on the surface of the humeral condyle um, and also on the cranial aspect of that proximal radius. So, yeah, we absolutely nailed that just based on the radiographs. So one of the reasons why I included this case is uh, I think some of the changes that we can see here, particularly on the left, um, are reasonably subtle. So um, it, it's easy to take a quick glance at this left elbow and maybe conclude that there's not really very much going on here. Um, but if you look carefully, then there are some changes here. So, so there are some osteophytes associated with this elbow joint, and there is a little bit of sclerosis. So it is worth taking um, a closer look at this left elbow joint. And again, um, if you just maybe cast a quick glance at this right elbow, you might think, well, it doesn't really look too bad. Um, but if you take a closer look, you can see that there are a number of big osteophytes here um, in a number of different places. Um, so proximal aspect. Um, of um, the cranial surface of that radius, the anconeal process. We've got this little mineralized structure adjacent to the medial coronoid, um, and potentially an anconeal process as well. Um, and then those suspicions um, are absolutely vindicated by the CT scan, where we've got a big fragment associated with the right medial coronoid and a small fragment associated with the left medial coronoid, and a whole bunch of changes that are associated with that, including some big osteophytes um, in all of the typical places. So cranial surface, the proximal radius, medial coronoid, anconeal process, humeral coronoid. Um, so yeah, you do a, a great job of um, interpreting um, that radiograph. Um, I, I didn't think that the changes on the radiograph um, were um, that severe, and I thought the changes on the CT were much more obvious, um, which is why um, I've included this case, because I think it's really nice to look at radiographs um, and then compare the changes that you see on the radiographs to the CT, um, just to help convince yourself that, that you are absolutely right, um, and those changes that you describe on the radiographs um, are, are absolutely correct. So yeah. Anybody have any other questions or comments about uh, case number four, which is our last case of the evening? Can I ask a quick, a quick question? Yeah. How you would describe the fragment on the left as a fragment in situ? Uh, yeah, so, uh, so you, you, you're kind of querying whether or not it's it's displaced or not, this, this, little, this little fragment. Um, I mean, for me, I think there's there's definitely a fissure line there, and it is bisecting that, that medial coronary process, and there is definitely a discrete, clearly marginated, mineralized structure that is adjacent to that 
uh, for me, it's fragmented. For me, it needs arthroscopy. Um, and I probably won't worry too much about uh, adding in situ or displaced or undisplaced. I mean, what, what the, the orthopedic surgeon wants to know is, do I need to scope these elbows? And the answer is absolutely, and you need to scope both. Okay, thanks. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions about case number four? No, everybody happy. Okay. All right. So before we finish for the evening, anybody have any questions about any of tonight's cases? Because if not, then uh, I will sign off um, and I wish you all a very good evening um, and I hope to see you all again in a month's time for uh, know, so October's uh, film reading. Um, so yeah, thank you all for joining me and um, I'll hopefully see you all again 